Well, hello, everyone, and good morning. Good to see all of you, and thank you for joining us here at uh, Palm West Community Church for our worship service. Uh, Before I uh, begin my message today, I just want to welcome all of you, and I also want to encourage you to continue to pray for our church family during this very challenging time. Uh, Fortunately, the numbers in Arizona are getting better as far as the number of cases of COVID, and so within the next few weeks, our leaders will be meeting to pray and to discuss our options for the fall and what options we have in front of us. So pray for us for wisdom in that. We also want to thank you for your continued generosity and support. We want to encourage you, if you're watching online, to continue to support the church family during this very difficult time. God has been so good and you have been so faithful, but we want to ask you to continue uh, to support our church family during this season. Now, with that being said, today we continue our series on the book of Jeremiah, and uh, we've entitled our series Exile and Hope, because Jeremiah comes and brings some very, very difficult words to the people, and he tells them that they're being called, that God is going to lead them into an exile, a time of great unsettling and turmoil, but God is also going to redeem them and to bring them back. Now, last week, we talked about good and bad kings, the fact that there were leaders overseeing the nation of Israel, and some of those kings, like Josiah, were very good, very righteous, very godly, and there were other kings, such as Zedekiah and Jehoiakim, that were not nearly as well. Actually, they were rebelling against the Lord. And we also even looked at Nebuchadnezzar and Necho, the king of Egypt, etc., all of whom uh, Nehemiah had interactions with during his almost four decades of ministry. Today, though, we transition, and today we're going to talk about leadership, but we're going to talk about spiritual leadership. And unfortunately, I've entitled this message, Failed Leadership, because by and large, the leaders during the days of Jeremiah were, in fact, failing. The spiritual leaders had failed God, and they had failed the people. Jeremiah was one of the few that stood out as faithful, as as true to the word of God in trying to lead the people. Now, the Bible, from beginning to end, talks about how God uses leaders. Some people had titles, and some did not. Some were called to be civil leaders and other spiritual leaders. Some had titles like prophets and priests and judges and kings and pastors and elders and apostles. Others had no title at all. Some led for a season, some for the long term. Some were good and made a great impact positively. Others failed miserably. But the reality is that we see God using individual leaders throughout the scripture. Now, a leader is basically just a person of influence, a person who has influence over others. Now, in that sense, all of us are leaders. If you're a spouse, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're a neighbor, all of us in some sense are leaders because we have influence over others. But there are some people that God calls into the office of leadership. Now, Jesus, we are told in the book of Ephesians, is the head of the church. Ultimately, as Christians, we are to look to Christ. Christ is the one who is to lead and guide. But God uses leaders as conduits to carry out his mission on this earth. Jeremiah himself was a leader. Jeremiah was called by God to speak hard and challenging words to the people, calling them to turn back, to repent, and to come to God. But unfortunately, there were other spiritual leaders in the days of Jeremiah who were also called to be prophets and priests, but unfortunately, they were working against Jeremiah. They were contradicting his message. They were undermining his authority, and in some cases, actively working against him. The book of Jeremiah speaks about leaders in chapter 2 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 14 and 18 and 20 and 28, and more and more chapters speaks about the spiritual leaders of his day. But today, I'm going to turn our attention to Jeremiah chapter 23, and if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open up to chapter 23, because this is an entire chapter that is dedicated to the spiritual leaders of Israel during the days of Jeremiah. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through this chapter, not the whole chapter because it's almost 40 verses long, but we're going to walk through a portion of this chapter and we're going to talk about four key mistakes, four ways the leaders, the spiritual leaders failed the people of Israel and ultimately failed God. So as we begin in Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 1 and 2, we see the first mistake they made is the spiritual leaders failed to adequately care for the people. Now, I'm sure in some sense they did care for the people and they cared for God, but the reality was that they failed miserably to offer the kind of care that God was calling them to give. 
Now, Jeremiah, as we saw in previous weeks, had a burden for God. He had this this fire inside of him to serve God, and he had this deep compassion, this burden for the people that left him in tears. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he was often broken up and moved to tears when he saw the state of his nation and the rebellion of God's people. The priests, the prophets who lived during the reign of Jeremiah, though, for the most part, they failed to provide adequate care. In chapter 23, verses 1 and 2, here's what it says. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend to my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and not bestowed care upon them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil that you have done. Now, first of all, the word here, shepherds, is speaking primarily to the priests. Now, there are two key sets of spiritual leaders in the days of Jeremiah. There were pastors or priests, and there were prophets. Prophets would go, and they were supposed to hear the word of the Lord, and prophets would proclaim messages to the people. They would say, thus says the Lord. Oftentimes, prophets would live outside the community, or they would have some means of space or margin in their life where they had time to be alone and to seek and to hear God's voice. A couple of weeks ago, I told you a story where Jeremiah was asked to inquire of the Lord, and the Bible says he inquired of the Lord, and 10 days later, God spoke to him. Prophets often had this margin in their life where they could call upon God, seek the Lord, and they would wait for God to speak, and then they would relay those words to the people. They did not have the Holy Spirit was not upon all people the way it is now. They did not have the scriptures as we have the scriptures here today. Then, on the other hand, you had priest and priest their job was to work walk with the people they lived among the people they would walk with the people they would shepherd the people and try to implement the word of the lord that was given through the deuteronomic law and through the prophets but here jeremiah says as the lord spoke to him my shepherds have failed my people They have failed to care for them it says here because you have in verse number two you have scattered my flock you have driven them away and you have not bestowed care upon them. Therefore, I will punish you for the evil you have done. Now, does this mean that they drove them out of town? No. What it means is that that the shepherds were enabling idolatry to take place. They were allowing the people's hearts to drift. They were allowing them to follow after other gods. And not only were they allowing this, but they were often enabling it and encouraging it. And because of this, the flock was scattered, not in the sense that they were leaving Jerusalem, but the fact that they were walking away from the Lord. They were being pushed away by false worship. They may have thought they knew God, but they did not really know his heart. John Maxwell says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And one of the first jobs of a spiritual leader is to be sure that we're trying to bestow care, to be sure that people know we care. Now, sometimes when you care for people, you still have to have difficult words. Remember, Jesus got thrown out of his hometown. Jesus confronted the Pharisees and upset them. But caring for the people is a sense of compassion that we genuinely care about where they are. When Jesus arrived at the shores in Mark chapter six, the Bible says that he looked upon them and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, if you join us for our Sunday morning connection, which occurs at 11 o'clock on Zoom, I'm gonna talk this week about Ezekiel because Ezekiel was a contemporary of Jeremiah and Ezekiel has an entire chapter dedicated to the spiritual overseers, the, the priests, and he has a whole other chapter that's dedicated to the prophets because much of Ezekiel's words are, are very much the same as Jeremiah's. They failed to care for the people. But second of all, the leaders failed in this. The spiritual leaders of Jeremiah's day failed the character test. Not only did they fail to care for the people, but they failed the test of character. Now, a big part of spiritual leadership should be integrity. Now, the Bible does say that no one is righteous, no, not one. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and this includes spiritual leaders. Haddon Robinson used to pray a prayer before he would preach, and his prayer went like this. Lord, if these people knew about me what you know about me, they will not listen to a word I say. 
Because Haddon Robinson was a man that was very much aware that even though he was godly and seeking the Lord and the Lord's hand was upon him, he knew that in his heart he was still a sinful person like every other person in the pews. We are all fallible. And if you look close enough and long enough at any and every spiritual leader, at some point their humanity will be revealed. Because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Peter walked into the house of Cornelius, the Bible says that Cornelius fell at his feet to give him reverence and honor. And Peter's response, stand up. I am a mere man, just a human being like you, Cornelius. True spiritual leaders understand that they are just as broken, just as prone to sin as every other person on the planet, save Jesus Christ. But spiritual leaders are called to character development. We are called to use our words and our actions and our practices to model Christ. The Apostle Paul said these very, I tell you, as a pastor, these words are intimidating to me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Paul says, I'm living in such an exemplary way that I want you to follow me and I'm following Christ. Spiritual leaders are called to endure challenges and overcome certain uh, temptations. They're called to lead not just with their words, but with their actions. Jeremiah did this. Jeremiah modeled great character as we saw a few weeks ago as we spent four weeks looking at the life of the prophet. Jeremiah worshiped the Lord. He did not give in or succumb to moral failure. Jeremiah lived a celibate life because God told him to and he made a a sacrifice there to do so. He endured persecution and he endured rejection and he did not quit even when he was tempted to throw in the towel. But the spiritual leaders by and large during the day of Jeremiah They failed the character test. Jeremiah 23, 9 through 11 says, concerning the prophets, once again, the ones who are proclaiming the word, my heart is broken within me. My bones tremble. I'm like a drunken man, like a strong man overcome by wine. Because the Lord and his holy words, Jeremiah says, God has revealed to me, God has revealed to me that these people that are spiritual leaders, these people that everyone's looking up to, that everyone's following, these people that, 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 that people in general think are so spiritual, Jeremiah says, my heart is broken within me because God has shown me something. In verse number 10, the land is full of idolaters. Because of the curse of the land, it land lies parched, and the pastures in the wilderness are withered. The prophets follow an evil course, and they use their power unjustly. This term, this phrase, unjustly, appears over and over and over again in Jeremiah, as it does every one of the prophets. This idea of being fair with people, caring for people, not playing favorites, not using your power inappropriately. It's a theme that is, that is magnified in every single one of the minor prophets with the exception of one. It's spoken of in Isaiah. It's spoken of in Jeremiah. It's spoken of in Ezekiel. This idea of, 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 being, uh, of being just, of being fair. But here Jeremiah says the prophets follow an evil course. They use their powers unjustly. Both prophet and priest are godless. Even in the temple I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. If you read down later in chapters, chapter 23 of Jeremiah, verses 13 and 14, he, he likens the prophets of Samaria and the prophets of Jerusalem to, listen, Sodom. Now the sins of Sodom, by the way, were not just sexual sins. They were sins of injustice and they were sins of unhospitality. When you read Ezekiel, he's very clear about this, that it's, it wasn't just because they were sexually immoral. They were other sins of the people. And Jeremiah says, the prophets of today are like the prophets of Sodom. They're leading the people into all kinds of immorality and ungodliness. Jeremiah in an earlier verse in chapter 6, verse 13 through 15 says, from the least of them to the greatest, all of them are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, they practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. They are, are they ashamed of their detestable conduct, Jeremiah says? No, they have no shame at all, and they do not even know how to blush. Unfortunately, the prophets and the priests in the days of Jeremiah were failing the people, not just in what they were proclaiming, but they were failing the people in the character in which they were leading out of. Mark Twain uh, is a great American writer, very humorous, a lot of great lines from Mark Twain. But as you may know, Mark Twain was not a believer. He rejected God. 
But the reason he rejected God was not because he didn't have some good examples in his life, because his wife and his mother were very godly people that he respected. But when Mark Twain grew up, he knew elders and deacons who owned slaves and abused those slaves. He heard leaders in the church using foul language and practicing dishonesty as they conducted their business affairs while speaking piously at church on Sunday morning. He listened to ministers use the Bible to justify slavery and the abuse of minorities. And although he saw the genuine love of Christ in his mother and his wife, the examples of the church leaders that he saw led him to be bitter towards God. Those of us who are called into leadership, we have to be sure that we watch our life and our doctrine closely. Third, the spiritual leaders in Jeremiah's day failed to challenge the people. Now to this day, this is a problem that we continue to see. When Jeremiah spoke to the people, Jeremiah was not afraid to say what had to be said. He wasn't afraid to upset the people, to rankle them, to cause them to question certain things. And on some occasions, the people actually got angry at people. Remember, Pasher got so angry, he put him in stocks. The people on more than one occasion tried to plot to kill Jeremiah because when Jeremiah was calling them to repentance, when Jeremiah was saying, listen, there are some things in your life, you have some blind spots that God wants to eradicate, that God wants to expose. And when God, and through Jeremiah, began to challenge the people about repentance in their own life, they got a little testy. Too many leaders today, as in the days of Jeremiah, as we'll see in a moment, we want to be liked. And because of that, we tend to have the temptation to pander to people. The phrase sometimes is, preach to the choir. Let's tell them what they want to hear. Let's let everyone get excited about how bad everyone else is and how good we are. And this doesn't mean that we don't want to learn. Everyone gets excited about learning a new interpretation or learning some insight into some new Hebrew or Greek word but very few people really want to be challenged about their character. Very few people want to be told that they aren't as holy as they may think they are. In Jeremiah's days, one of the themes that we read over and over and over and over again is that the leaders of his day were telling the people what they wanted to hear while Jeremiah was telling them what they needed to hear. Jeremiah chapter 23, as you drop down to our chapter here and look at verses 16 through 17, here's what it says. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds and not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come upon you. The prophets were validating the people. People that were living in sin, whose hearts were stubborn, oh, no harm's gonna be upon you. God's hand is upon you. To those who were rebelling, oh, God is gonna be with us. Those who were scared because judgment was coming upon Jerusalem, oh, it's gonna be peace, peace, God's gonna deliver you. In chapter number 28, we see an entire chapter dedicated to Jeremiah, and there's an individual named uh, Hananiah who's a prophet, and Hananiah gets up, and the Bible says that Jeremiah put a yoke and said, God's going to put a yoke on this nation, and for 70 years, we're going to suffer in exile because of our sin against the Lord, and Hananiah came, and Hananiah takes the yoke off Jeremiah and breaks it and says, no, the Lord said that we're going to suffer no more than two years, and everything's going to be fine. And Jeremiah sarcastically says to him, Amen. May it be as you said, Hananiah. But if it's not as you said, if in fact God judges us more than two years, you're going to be held accountable for your false words and your false prophecies. And sure enough, the Bible says that the the exile lasted longer than that and Hananiah was struck down shortly thereafter. You see, the prophets were tempted to tell the people what they wanted to hear. 
In chapter 6 and chapter 8, we read a verse earlier where the prophets were saying peace, peace, where there was no peace. The Bible says in a couple different times in the book of Jeremiah that they were dressing the wound of the people as though it were not serious. Because you see, the people were looking at this, and I mentioned this last week when I talked about the kings, where they said, listen, we're God's holy people. Zedekiah is our king. Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan. The Babylonians are pagans. God is for us. But God says, no, because of your sin, I'm actually working against you and I'm gonna use Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to teach my people a lesson. Because God's greatest concern was not to punish his people. God wanted to see his people become holy and they had become so holy, they were blind to their blindness. There was sin in the camp, and rather than taking it seriously, the prophets were glossing it over. In Jeremiah 5, verse 30 and 31, it says this. A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies, and the priests rule by their own authority. And notice this phrase. My people love it. My people love it that way, but what will you do in the end? The people love the fact that the, that the prophets were validating them and giving them encouragement and edification and saying to them, listen, you don't have anything to worry about. You guys are awesome. And the priests are leading by their own authority and they're validating the people and they're never calling the people or challenging the people. The people love that. And the, conversely, when Jeremiah called the people out and told them what they needed to hear, it made them angry. There was vitriol that rose up. I mean, how dare you say that me as a man or a woman of God, that there are things in my life that aren't truly godly. Almost all spiritual leaders that I know that are truly godly and humble will tell you that they do not like confrontation and they do not like upsetting people. Our church, Pastor Peter, Pastor Brian, They don't like to go around and tell people what to do. They don't like upsetting people. Our church has a number of incredibly godly men that are retired from ministry. Pastor Bruce Schippel and Dr. Gallagher. Pastor Ed Turns. Pastor Ken Cleaver. John Anderson. Tom Phillips. If you know these people who have served in ministry, you know these are people who don't like upsetting people. They're very compassionate, godly men, but every one of them will tell you the same story. Sometimes God lays things on our hearts. Sometimes God requires us to say things that rub people the wrong way. We do not need preaching to the choir. Sometimes we need to be challenged because no matter how great we are, God has more he wants to do in us. And you understand that when Jesus walked on this earth, he was incredibly gracious and compassionate to the woman that was caught in adultery. He was incredibly gracious and compassionate with the woman at the well who had been married seven times. But when Jesus acknowledged, when Jesus came in contact with the Jews, when he came in contact with the Pharisees, the religious leaders, he often was very harsh and very direct with them. Jesus was compassionate with people who did not know the Lord, but the people who claimed to know the Lord and claimed to believe they were on the right path, those were the people he had the toughest words for. He called out. The Bible says in the book of uh, 1 Timothy, or 1 Peter, that judgment begins with the house of God. For us to be truly edified, we need to be challenged sometimes. When I came here 17, almost 18 months ago, I have found over the last year and a half some of the most kind, some of the most compassionate, some of the most gracious, some of the most loving, some of the most generous people I've ever met in my life in this church. This church has some amazing people. I've actually started a journal where I'm, I'm writing stories of different people I encounter because some of you have blessed me with incredible stories, stories of overcoming hardship, stories of achieving things, stories about your career. There's been so many stories that have blessed me when I look at people in the lat- latter seasons of their life telling me about things they did 30, 40, 50, 70, 80 years ago. But as incredible as the people of this church are, Every single one of us has room for more growth. 
There are attitudes that God wants to eradicate from our life. There are beliefs that God wants to shape and mold. There are behaviors that God wants to call us into. Some of us still are way too judgmental of people who don't think and act like we do. Some of us still have very short tempers. Some of us still have very harsh tongues. Some of us still go to the negative and we complain about everything and everybody every chance we get. Some of us are prone to gossip. Some of us to self-righteousness. Some of us to doubt and unbelief. The reality is, regardless of how amazing we are, God's vision for our life is so much greater than we have for ourselves. We are called to be like Jesus, and none of us have arrived there yet. The people in the days of Jeremiah, they pandered. They preached to the choir. They got a lot of amens from the people. Because they talked about how bad the world was, how bad those people are, and how righteous we are. That'll get you a lot of amens, a lot of hugs on Sunday morning, but it doesn't lead to edification and it doesn't lead to transformation. It leads to a false sense of security. Fourth and finally, the spiritual leaders in Jeremiah's day failed to call on the Lord. At the root of all of it, the leaders in Jeremiah's day faced a temptation that all leaders face. See, early on in spiritual leadership, what happens is this. When God calls you into ministry, or maybe even if you look back on your life and you taught a Sunday school class, you sang a solo on Sunday morning for the first time, you're nervous, you're like, oh. You know, and many times what happens is we realize our competency is very low. We feel very insecure, incapable of doing this, and so our competency is low, but our dependency is high. We're like, God, I can't do this. God, I need your help. You know, we're very dependent upon the Lord. But what happens over time is as we get more and more experience teaching and talking and preaching and leading, what happens is we gain a little more experience, and as our, our competency, our experience and our wisdom rises, our dependency begins to decrease. And we very subtly begin to trust in our own abilities because we've done it so many times that we're not as dependent upon God. It's a temptation that all leaders face, and I will tell you it's one that I fight regularly. The leaders of Jeremiah's day, that's exactly what happened. And they were no longer seeking the Lord, but they were trusting in their own flesh. Jeremiah 6, 18 says, um, but which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord are seen his word, who has listened. I'm sorry, Jeremiah 23, uh, 18 says, but which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? So as we go through Jeremiah, we see here at the very end, he's saying in, in verse number 18, they're not even seeking me. They're not even seeking my wisdom. They're saying, thus says the Lord, without even drawing near or inquiring of me. When you read down later, we have a beautiful passage here in verses 19 through 24 where it talks about the Lord, talks about his transcendence and his, his eminence, the fact that he is near and yet far. But then he goes on in verse 25 and following to talk about the prophecies, the prophets who are prophesying prophesying delusions of their own mind. They're not seeking him. And then in verse 33 through 40, the chapter ends by saying, stop saying the message of the Lord. The prophets keep saying, this is a message of the Lord. He said, it's not a message of the Lord because the prophets are not even seeking me. They were sharing the delusions of their own mind. Jeremiah 2, 8 says, the priests do not ask, where is the Lord? And those who deal with the law do not even know me. The leaders rebelled against me. Jeremiah, Jeremiah sought the Lord over and over and over again. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places where he inquired of the Father. The apostles, we read, fasted and prayed before decisions were made. It says they were constantly in prayer. When we look at the days of Jeremiah, the people and the nation had gone astray. Part of that was because of last week as we addressed the kings, the spiritual leaders failed the people. But even when leaders like Josiah tried to redirect the nation and curb certain actions, he was not able to change the heart. And part of the reason the hearts were not changed is because the spiritual leaders failed the people miserably. They failed to truly care for them. They were more looking out for their own interests than the people. They failed to model and to live a life of character 
and they failed to take responsibility for their own sins. They were unwilling to challenge and confront the people in their sin, and they did not call upon the Lord. But Jeremiah did. And that's why Jeremiah was a man of God. And it's why Jeremiah today gives us an example, an inspiration of what it means to follow the Lord even when the entire herd is going the opposite direction. But there's one more element to chapter number 23. If you have a Bible and you've been following along through this chapter with me, I want you to go back to verse number five. Because while Jeremiah, through the word of the Lord, comes to him and he challenges the spiritual leaders of his day, we find this very beautiful messianic passage. This passage that speaks about the coming of the Messiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety and in the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. You see, Jesus is the only person that is ever fully going to reign and to rule. The person, the only person who's going to lead perfectly. He came and he gave his life. He lived a sinless life so that we could be forgiven. And he died on the cross and rose again from the grave so that we could be forgiven of our sin and we could have the hope of eternal life. And one day he is going to return. And when he returns, he's going to judge the living and the dead. And then he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. And when he establishes the new heavens and the new earth, Christ will reign and rule. And only then will we follow a leader who is impeccable and perfect in all ways. Until then, all we can hope for is our leaders. And those of us who are leaders will try to follow in the footsteps of Jeremiah. That we will avoid the failures of those who have gone before us. And that even though we stumble through in our own humanity and brokenness, that we will care for the people, that we will challenge the people, that we will lead with character, and that we will call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we acknowledge that there are no perfect human spiritual leaders, beginning with myself. But Lord, I pray that you help us to lead well. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that anyone in this room, anyone watching this that is called to be a leader in some capacity, that you help them not to feel an immense sense of pressure, but help them with humility to acknowledge their weakness and insufficiency and help them, dear God, to be faithful in what you are leading and calling them to do. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you help us to acknowledge our failures and weaknesses as followers and as leaders. And Lord, may your power be made perfect through our weakness, even as we wait for the perfect leader, Christ, to appear before us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.